Since the dawn of the ironclad era, Sweden had mostly restricted its naval capabilities to coastal defence, with a series of monitors started courtesy of Swedish native and inventor of USS Monitor, John Ericsson. And later in the 19th century, this had graduated to a series of coastal defence ships, starting with the three-strong Sphere class and the comparably sized Odin class. But the Odins were still under construction as the latter part of the 1890s saw the first true pre-dreadnoughts entering service, signifying a shift in naval technology. Accordingly, the Swedish Navy felt it had to react, and so in 1896 work began on a new Panzerkep, or armoured ship, which used the Odin class as a starting point. Work progressed quickly, and a first draft design was ready in 1897, Refinements were made and orders were placed, so the keel laying of the ship, which was still without a name, was undertaken in February 1899. At some point after this, the Swedish government decided to name the ship Dristegetin, I think, which was roughly translated to either audacious or possibly bold. Since one of the big shifts in the 1890s had been to new longer barreled guns that fired comparatively rapidly, the ship's main battery consisted of a pair of 8.3-inch 44 caliber guns, a slight step down in size from the 10-inch guns on the Odins, but capable of much more rapid rates of fire. These were located in two single turrets, one fore and one aft. Secondary armament consisted of six single casement-mounted 6-inch guns, three per side, with 10 single 57mm anti-torpedo boat guns scattered about the ship, and a pair of single submerged torpedo tubes, one per side, to round things out. The ship's boats were also lightly armed, carrying a single 37mm cannon each. Armour layout was nice and simple, using the new face-hardened armour that had been through the Harvey process. The ship had an 8-inch thick belt, a 2-inch thick armour deck, and the turrets were provided with 8 inches of faceplate protection, with 6 inches elsewhere. This was actually very comparable to the armour of a much larger second-class battleship, and even some of the more lightly protected early first-class pre-dreadnought battleships, which wasn't bad for a ship that only displaced about 3,200 tonnes at normal load. Speed was again competitive, with 5,400 shaft horsepower driving a pair of vertical triple expansion engines, which turned a pair of screws for a top speed of just under 17 knots, which meant that essentially the Swedes had created a ship that was comparable in almost all paper specs with a half-decent full-size battleship, with the exception of size and the number and ultimate calibre of the heavy guns, which was of course dictated by that small size. And that, in turn, was dictated simply by the limited budget. But her draft of only 16 feet meant that she could go many places that a full-scale battleship simply could not, which was vital in the shallow coastal waters of the Western Baltic. Launched in April 1900 after just over a year on the slipway, and commissioned in September 1901, the ship saw out the first half of the decade in relative calm. 1906 and 1907 were a bit more interesting as she conducted a number of overseas voyages, stopping relatively often due to her short range. With the start of the 1910s, she was brought in for a refit, the pole foremast being replaced by a stronger tripod type, which allowed the installation of a high-mounted rangefinder. World War I was again relatively peaceful, as she maintained Swedish neutrality alongside other ships of the Swedish Navy, after which she had a small refit in 1922 that removed two of the 57mm guns, as well as the torpedo tubes, and replaced them with a pair of Bofors 57mm anti-aircraft guns. But with a number of more modern coastal defence ships now in service, it was clear that the older vessels would either soon be scrapped, converted to secondary roles, or would be found a new frontline role. The latter was to be the Drist de Gettin's fate. In 1927, she was brought into the dockyards and the main guns, along with the secondary guns, were all removed, and instead four 75mm anti-aircraft guns, two 40mm anti-aircraft guns, and four machine guns were installed, and it seems from the photos that the 57mm guns were also removed. The superstructure was completely rebuilt with a large crane installed, and now the ship could carry two large or three small seaplanes, which were launched by lifting them into the water as there was no space aboard for a catapult. 
When World War II broke out, she was paired with the larger and more capable cruiser Gotland, but her old machinery began giving trouble, and she was soon relegated to harbour defence and coastal patrol only. Soon after the end of the war, she was decommissioned, and in 1947 was formally removed from service. But instead of being scrapped, it was decided to use her as a target ship. She survived this role for all over two decades before she was finally consigned to the breakers, although in a last act of defiance she broke her toe and sank in shallow water, forcing the authorities to refloat her with a wooden coffer dam built around the hull, which allowed her to be finally towed to the scrapyard in 1961. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.